We have a good food festival conference. Our uh, first time in Santa Monica. Uh, my name is Jim Slama. I'm the uh, president of FamilyFarm.org. We've done a similar conference in Chicago uh, six times. And uh, Laura Avery, the director of the Santa Monica Farmers Market, uh, she and I have been friends for a while. Uh, said, you know what, Jim? I love what you're doing in Chicago. Can you do something similar with us in Santa Monica? So here we are. And uh, we're really happy to be here. It's been uh, a great couple of days. We started on Wednesday. Um, we'll be going all weekend. Uh, hope you'll join us at Santa Monica High School Saturday and Sunday. We've got chef demos and really some world-class speakers and uh, gardening panels and food preservation workshops and really just a, a full uh, full two days of fun. And uh, but today today is all about how do we create new public policy that supports this good food movement? Uh, how do we make create, uh, connections between farmers and um, buyers, whether it be distributors or restaurants or uh, supermarkets or schools or hospitals? And so um, it's exciting for us to walk down that quad and see, wow, all these companies or farmers or uh, people, they want to build these connections. They want to help support this good food movement. They want to provide access to healthy school, uh, to, to healthy food, you know, not only to people with means, but also to everybody who wants fresh, healthy food. So um, for, for us, this panel is a, it's a really important topic. It's, you know, how do we ramp it up? Uh, you know, right now, maybe three, four, five percent of the food that's grown and processed and sold in America is kind of meets that definition of good food. You know, it's local, it's more family uh, scale, uh, produced by family scale operators, you know, using no or less inputs, uh, treats animals humanely, and, uh, We've got a way to go from you know, three to five percent to a lot more than that. And so we've got a really an outstanding panel of people who um, bring a breadth and depth of knowledge to this dialogue. So uh, we're going to start, I'm going to start just, uh, uh, you know, why don't we just kind of go one by one. Um, I'm just going to introduce them briefly. <laughs> Uh, and I think they'll tell their story, you know, who they are, what they do with their company, and how it relates to this topic of, of scaling up. And we'll, we'll start at the end. Uh, Kathy, Kathy Lawrence is a program director at School Food Focus. Kathy. I'm just going to start? Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> all right, so at School Food Focus, um, we're all about transforming food options for school kids in the U.S., and we believe in the power of public procurement. Uh, and I think that for me, as someone who's worked in sustainable agriculture and local food systems development, food justice and advocacy for over 20 years, it's an incredible privilege and exciting moment to really be working with some of the largest school districts in the country uh, where the rubber really hits the road in terms of engaging with the very mainstream conventional food system and having the power of that public school procurement and the undeniable public interest in children's health and well-being behind us. Uh, and so we work with about 33 of the largest districts in the country, um, really looking to transform what's available in school cafeterias throughout the school day and beyond so that kids are well set for lifelong learning, for lifelong health, can become active, productive citizens in our society. Um, in terms of school lunch in this country, we've got about 31 million kids eating lunch a day in public schools. About $13 billion a year is spent on school lunch and school breakfast. So we're talking about a heck of a lot of food and a heck of a lot of money that could be going in the right direction. The flip side of that is that school food service directors like Rodney Taylor, who you'll hear from in a moment, have about a dollar per lunch to be working with. And so the school food system, to a great degree, reflects the conventional food system that we've got. And that's what we're trying to turn around. Our core stakeholders are the school food service professionals themselves that, despite all odds, are really taking risks to turn around 
uh, the foods that they're serving to get more local, more healthful, and more regionally uh, sourced foods into their schools within the federal budget that they've got, within the scrutiny and the regulations and all of the paperwork that they have to deal with. So for us, it's a real privilege to work with these passionate, dedicated, and practical change leaders at the school level. Um, we work across sectors we, with all kinds of partners, with government, with vendors, with national allies, uh, and are really trying to change the hearts and minds of folks in school food service from within school food service, the parents, the teachers, the kids themselves, the policy makers, and the public at large. Um, I'm just going to talk about a few things that some of the large districts we work with have been able to make happen because we're trying to help people understand what is possible and what is desirable in terms of our national investment in children's health through school food. Uh, Jennifer Labar is with the Oakland Unified School District. She has produce markets um, that run in 24 of her schools in the district. Uh, one time a week they are serving uh, all local organic or no pesticide uh, produce in those schools year round, uh, primarily in food deserts. In some of the areas in Oakland they've got five liquor stores for every grocery store. So these are highly underserved areas. She's also hiring a new farm to school supervisor for the entire district, so making great strides there. Uh, in San Diego, um, they're really working to make the local vegetables and their local salad bars the center of their menu planning. They're working currently with 12, uh, 10 to 12 farmers. Um, they basically have a handshake agreement with them. Those farmers are planting in advance for what the school needs, understanding that that's a market that's reliable and dependable and willing to work with them. In the last school year, they bought 90,000 tons of local organic, all organic produce with the single exception of no spray apples from Julienne, which I think is well known in this region. Um, there's an evaluation report coming out on that project uh, so people can read up on it. In Portland, Oregon, Yita Greater Sweeney is the school food service director there. She's now currently sourcing 32% of all the food that she is serving in her district locally. So that's across the board, fruit, vegetables, dairy, meat, grains, the whole shebang. Not all of it is grown locally. A lot of it is, but all of it, 32% uh, of that is sourced locally, so she's supporting other kinds of local businesses. Um, and she's making her food budget stretch as far as it possibly can. She has brought that program from in the red to in the black, um, largely through making best possible use of USDA commodity foods and combining that with local ingredients. They have a chicken burrito which uses commodity chicken and <coughs> commodity cheese combined with local rice and local tortillas. Same thing with a beef product that um, she's getting from USDA Foods and then accompanying with local potatoes. They have, for the first time on their menu, wild Alaskan pollock, which is, again, a USDA Foods commodity product that she's combining with a bunch of different things. And for those of you who aren't familiar with school food service, ranch dressing is like mana <laughs> from heaven. The kids put it on everything, right, Rodney? Vegetables, they dip their pizza in it. You know, it's like a lot of them won't even eat lunch without it. Gita has completely eliminated ranch dressing from her schools, all of her schools, and replaced it with a local Marionberry dressing, and this year added two more dressings that are lower fat, lower sugar, much more healthy, and the kids are loving it. Um, in terms of working with USDA foods, Anyone familiar with the U.S. commodity system, how it works? So we're talking very mainstream, very conventional, and very open for the first time in probably 30 or 40 years to really working with school districts and school food advocates to increasingly improve the quality and the healthfulness of the products that they provide. So we've been working with Chicago uh, Public Schools on chicken, which is the number one protein that's served in schools across the country. And with our help and with USDA's work, Chicago Public Schools will this year be receiving and serving 1.3 million pounds of chicken leg quarters that they are receiving raw, frozen from USDA so that they can control every ingredient in the recipes that they create. Um, Jim, I'm sure, will be able to tell you about their fresh and flash frozen produce project, which many of the regions of the country don't benefit from the kind of year-round growing climate that you've got here in California. 
So um, that's just a taste of what some of these large districts are doing to really buck the system and create the market pull as very large districts to leverage, leverage their procurement power so that school districts of all sizes across the country and school kids of all, si of all kinds across the country can get much better food today, tomorrow, next year, next decade. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> You know, Kathy referenced our work with the Chicago Public Schools. We've been their procurement partner on the, on the fruit and vegetable side. And over the last two years, they bought over $3 million of food from local farmers, which is really exciting. And they've also developed a program where they purchase, in essence, truckloads of produce uh, in season, take it to a, a processor, flash freeze it, and then you know, basically it's one day old when it's frozen. Uh, the nutrition's, nutritional levels on that versus, say, produce in January that's been shipped from God only knows where and been stuck in a warehouse for God only knows how long is so much better. And the fact is, they're supporting local farms and the kids like it. They're really doing well with this fresh local produce, so, uh, or fresh frozen produce. So uh, it's been an exciting. Uh, uh, opportunity to work with them. Uh, our next speaker, Jim Churchill, is. Uh, anybody ever had pixies? Woohoo! All right, Woo there he is. This, Mr. Pixie Man, he's done an amazing job uh, with his own orchard and then uh, developing a whole growers association. You want to talk about going to scale? He's yeah. going to talk a little bit about going to scale, and I think he's got some slides for us. I'm going to try something a little different. See if we've got some slides. So um, we're going to talk about scaling up, and this is, I, I'm standing here so I can see because they have to control it, and so I have to them to do. Um, basically, uh, this is before scaling up. This is packing in our barn. Um, uh, so uh, Ojai Pixies um, didn't, there used to be no tangerines sold after about January. Ojai Pixies um, are a, a late season tangerine that starts in March and goes until we run out sometime in June or July. Um, it started in 1980, a guy named Tony Thatcher of Friends Ranches and I planted some trees. Tony was just starting in farmers markets and he probably wanted to increase what he had and I didn't have anything in mind. I just, um, I, I had avocados and they were the wrong variety and they were, um, and they had root rot and I had to find something to grow and I didn't want to be a sun kiss grower. And I tasted a pixie tangerine and I said, well, that's good. And, that, that, and so now, um, this past year, we sold, uh, out of the Ohio Pixie Growers Association, we sold 1.2 million pounds, which is, for, this, for us, I mean, we're doing this ourselves, and for us, that's a lot. It's actually, in terms of produce volume, I just read in my Sunkist Growers newsletter yet last night that Sunkist is expecting to sell out of the Yuma district 5 million 40 pound cartons of lemons this season, and that's just one of their districts. So, 1.2 million pounds. It's, you know, it's not really that much, but it's a lot for us. Anyway, so prior to scaling up, can we go through a couple of slides quickly? There's Ojai, there's our ranch with the diagonals. That's my dad, he started the thing. Um, that's early marketing. <laughs> okay, let's go. Um, that's Lisa and myself um, as a young pirate farmer marketers before we do a damn thing. Let's, um, there, we go. let's hold this. This is, um, this is key to scaling up. We, for uh, the first five years of our existence, had one customer, and it's that man there. His name is Bill Fujimoto. Um, he used to run something called the Monterey Market, and for five years, he bought everything we could sell, and he, um, uh, and he made a market. He ran a market that was kind of a hub in Berkeley for food people in Berkeley, and you know there are some food people in Berkeley. And they, we got adopted by the food people in Berkeley, bless their hearts. Mm -hmm. and, um, and actually, Chez Panisse put us on their menu as Churchill Orchard Pixie Tangerines, and that was extremely helpful. And if you can manage that in terms of scaling up, you know, <laughs> that's a good way to go. 
Um, but I will say that um, that's that. What, what we were able to do what we did because we started small. There were there was first there was just Tony and me, and so in the next slide. So this is how Bill Fujimoto built the market for us. Those are his customers at the Monterey Market, um, and so we did that for five years or six years or something like that. And then he said, "Okay, I keep, you're going to have to find somebody else." And um, I called a bunch of people, and I ended up working with an outfit in in. in, in Vernon called uh, Melissa's World Variety, who took us on and helped us make a market. Let's do some more. There we are. There's the Ohio Pixie Growers Association about 10 years ago. Next, there's the Ohio Pixie Growers Association. Now, we are 36 farmers with 46 pieces of ground, um, and we do all of our selling and everything on a handshake, handshake agreement. That is to say, Tony Thatcher and his daughter Emily and myself and Lisa, we sell everything for everybody um, and everybody trusts us and we pay them. <laughs> and um, um, and it's, it's so far it's worked. Next, we, we built a logo. <clears throat> Next, we scaled up. After a while, we could we we couldn't use the little tiny packing house, and we went to the big packing house. This was our first day of our, of of, uh, of packing um, with the big bins and the big trucks, um, and uh, we're looking and trying. It was an orange packing house, and tangerines actually are really different from oranges, and it was very confusing for them. Um, but they they've stuck with us. This is Villa Park Asso Orchard Association. Next slide. That's sort of big, this is the first day of organic packing at Villa Park. This is, that's, I'm up there, and these are the wonderful people that do the grading. Next, and that's the big, um, the, that's my personal label, Lisa's at my label, um, and that's um, the big packing house once again. Another one, please. Another slide. Um, part of bag, part of, of scaling up is bagging. You will have seen bags. Um, and um, if this looks like the very first slide, <laughs> except with bigger machines, it kind of is. Bagging is, um, the bagging is done by hand. I mean, there are machines, but um, retailers want stuff in bags. Um, it's a kind of a shame because, um, you, well, it's, it's a shame. It's, it's not very environmentally aware and things like that, but um, it gives them a label on a piece of fruit. And so um, they like bags, and so we bag them. Um, that is probably fruit that's going to Fresh Point, um, actually. Uh, Fresh Point is here. Um, Martin Annenberg um, has been, uh, uh, from Fresh Point, has been, um, so this is part of what you want for scaling up, is you want relationships. Uh, you want relationships with stores, you want relationships with people who can get you into stores. Um, and um, so we have uh, a relationship with Martin Annenberg, who helps us with, um, Don Nishiguchi and Whole Foods in, in the Los Angeles area. What do we have next? Um, we traveled. That's, we went to New York City. Those people said, we own this town. It was scary. And, <laughs> here we are in Japan, right? See, the reputation label in Japan. <laughs> um, and and uh, having a relationship with Japan is kind of makes us proud. It's like selling coals to Newcastle. Um, next. We went to Washington, D.C. There's Emily. There's Emily Ayala um, in Washington, D.C. Um, we just get the word out every way we can. And the word is, for us, the word, we brand ourselves, and, and, and the word is Ojai Pixie Tangerines. What do we got? Oh, slow foods, bless their hearts, put us in the arc of taste. That was, um, that was great. That helpful, too. Next. And we go out to stores. Um, we, there's Lisa and Melissa's at some place, I'm not sure, a store, we do that. Next, that, that's me at a store, that's John Mackey. <laughs> a wildlife photo. <laughs> then if you don't know, he's the founder and chairman of Whole Foods Market. So, and, then, and then these are the people that came in and planted. So we have, you know, we have, uh, 1.2 million pounds. We have maybe 240 acres. These are the people that planted 500,000 trees in one year. They have hundreds of thousands of years. The cutie, um, I don't know, it doesn't say registered mark or trademark or anything, but cutie is not a variety. I don't know if you know this. Cutie is 
a piece of intellectual property and it's whatever they put in the box is a cutie. It's a, a diabolically ingenious kind of an idea and <laughs> it's, it's very rough for us because we are artisanal growers. We are low volume, kind of high cost because we're trying to produce in a certain way and um, they make it rough, uh, but we're still in there fighting and that's my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> How many acres total? Uh, 240 acres of pixie tangerines in the Ojai Valley. All right, 1.2 million pounds a year. That you scaled up. We did scale up. All right. Yeah. And thank you for thank you for having. You know, and you mentioned Whole Foods Market. I, we'd be remiss not acknowledging. I think a couple of their fo fo foragers are here. And uh, by the way, if you're a grower, uh, their foragers are here, uh, but also just their role in really awakening people to the local food movement and making these products available. I mean, when you go in their stores now, 90% of the produce, I'm blown away when I walk through their produce department, it's like it's all local. So yeah, you've done a really remarkable job. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. will have noticed on the back of your program about the film festival, the snag films. Um, where is it? Back of program. Calling all food fans. Wherever it is, on the back of your program. And I would just like to say that this film is about the Monterey market. And it was made by my wife, who is a very good filmmaker. And this is just an unashamed, unalloyed plug. I'd like you to consider looking at it and consider voting it for it as a good film, because it is one. And I have some copies of that happy now. What's it called? It's called Eat at Bills. Oh. And we're excited about this film voting because we've tracked down just about every food on film ever, including 140 obscure documentaries. And they're not all available to see, but links to them, and you know, if they're on Amazon or if they're on Netflix or whatever, a few of them are available to see. And you can vote for them. Well, there's two phases. Phase one is uh, voting for any one of 240 uh, in two categories, documentary and feature. And then uh, November 1st, we're going down to the top five. And so you'll be able to vote for, okay, which of these top five is the best one? And so the whole month of November, which is kind of full month, um, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of buzz on it. So tell your friends about it. We think it's going to be a really fun way to get people, a spit. we're really interested, not only getting them to see, is it Babette's Feast or is it like water for chocolate, but, um, you know, is it Food Inc. or is it some obscure, really cool docu documentary like Eat It Bills that most people haven't seen, but at least now they're going to know about. So um, thank you for, for bringing that up. Uh, our next speaker, Andrew Gunther, uh, is a leading expert in the way that we treat animals and is doing a lot to, as uh, the head of Animal Welfare Approved, uh, to change that and encourage farmers to adopt humane and sustainable farming practices. Andrew? Jim, thank you. I think that's uh, I deserve. For those of you that don't recognize the accent, I'm a native Texan. Or at least <laughs> I carry it, a Texas driving license. Um, I just so much appreciate being here and being on a panel with, with such greatness and people doing such phenomenal things. Sadly, I spent a lot of my life being Mr. Doom and Gloom and, and Mr. Negative because a lot of my role is to undo the damage that industrial agriculture is doing to the United States and indeed the planet. In uh, 2008 9, I was given the opportunity to become program director of Animal Welfare Proof. There's a couple of neat things that have happened recently that are worth noting. We're considered to be the most transparent and have the most stringent production standards in the United States and probably the world by the World Society of Protection of Animals. We're also considered to have the highest trustworthy rating from the Consumers Union in terms of what we do. I'm the luckiest dude alive because I get up every morning and I go out and find great family farmers, farmers doing the right thing in the right way, and I send out highly trained auditors to check that that's being done, and then I have a great team who spend the rest of their lives promoting what they do. And as of now, we're working with a thousand farms across the United States, across a million acres. So we're a growing program. We have between seven and 20 applications to join the program on a weekly basis. And I just get to fight Big Ag, and I, I just can't tell you how much I hate Big Ag for everything it's doing. Um, and I just want to get some key talents out there. I, I, I don't want to burst balloons or burst bubbles. 
There was a lady called Sylvia Earle, who I've admired for about a million years, and Sylvia will tell you she's not that old. Um, she's Mrs. Deepsea. She is the lady that, that understands the ocean better than any of us. And I met her on a, a late evening, and we had some supper in Aspen, and we were speaking, and we were speaking to Chevrolet and, and, and all the evil entities of the planet. <laughs> and God bless Sylvia, she opens up and says, all of you seem to think I'm from a different planet. And this is a 72-year-old lady who, who sits very demurely and very quietly. And she said, you're right, I am from a different planet. Because when I was born, there were 2 billion people on this planet. There are now 8 billion people on this planet. And as a society, we've got some, something to do, something to get together to change the way we interact with the world. And another seafood guy, and understand, I hate fish. <laughs> Honestly, if it was the last piece of protein on the planet, I wouldn't eat it. I'd eat my own hand before I ate a fish. <laughs> Barton Seaver was, was chatting the other day, and he said, Andrew, he said, farming is the way we interact with the planet. We're not doing a very good job, are we? And that's not just Big Ag that's not doing a very good job, it's all of us in this room that aren't doing a very good job because we're not getting the message out, we're not making it bigger as much as we can, and myself included, I do it 24 hours a day. I don't feel I'm doing enough to help people understand that when you buy a meat protein, and I'm not gonna to talk to the fact that it may or may not be welfare positive, but when you buy 99.9% .9 of the meat proteins in the United States, whether that's in a fast food restaurant or a normal restaurant, they will have been used producing antimicrobials. And for those of you here this morning listening to Bob Martin, MRSA is a phenomenal issue for us. Our program, we prohibit the non-therapeutic uh, use of antibiotics. We allow a farmer to treat a sick animal. Because removing antibiotics from the supply chain is not a positive move completely. Moving its willy-nilly use and unregulated use. How many of you here believe, let's have a show of hands, that a vet has to prescribe an antibiotic to a farm animal? Does anybody believe that, that a vet's involved in, in antibiotic usage? Well, no, they're not, because I can go to a local farmer's merchant and buy 10 pounds of tetramycin. You can buy a plastic bucket with no ID, my 14-year-old son went and did it for me, and I have a picture of him doing it. I mean, we've been banging up with antibiotics for ages, he doesn't get it. I have no idea what I'm going to do with a 10-pound tub of tetramycin, but the fact is I could go and buy one. There is something wrong with a farming system where somebody who isn't qualified, me, and my son, who is absolutely not qualified to walk, he's a 14-year-old teenage boy. Those of you who've got him know what I'm talking about. But we own a 10-pound bucket of tetramycin. What are we going to do with it? But I could go and feed that to my chickens at any dose I choose to. And too much is as bad as too little, and too little is as bad as too much. So what we're doing at AWA, and, and is what I work with, and I'll, I'll try and be quick because there's some great speakers, I'm privileged to work, and I'll, I'll highlight four groups particularly. I've got a group of 60 hog farmers in North Carolina who are producing between 150 and 200 hogs a week. They started with one. They work as a cooperative together, and they manage their own system. They had to cooperate and consolidate in order to supply retail, because very few farmers are big enough to supply a retail supply chain, just in terms of volume and capacity. I'm privileged to work with three of the largest producers of grass-fed beef in the United States, one out of Missouri, one out of Georgia, and one out of Texas. One of them's killing 560 cattle a week, the other one's killing just a little over 600 cattle a week. I'll leave you to guess which one's doing what. But all of them are working as groups and or cooperatives to meet the demands of retail. <coughs> and one of my messages coming here for all of us is to try and understand how we can hate Carvion, how we can hate Smithfield, how we can hate Tyson, and how we can hate Walmart. But we do need them. They've got distribution down to a fine art. They've got temperature control distribution down. There are nine billion people on this planet, not the two billion that we used to feed as farmers. Somehow we've got to take the good that they do, which is limited, kind of limited, 
they don't write very positive about them, but their distribution skills, their ability to, to move product around and make them pure. We've got to make them understand what we're doing is right and they've got to follow it. And there is only one solution in my mind, and that's to drive demand in the market, which is another part of AWA's project where we educate the consumer to drive them to make better buy decisions. Because everybody here, I'm assuming, can afford to go and feed themselves this afternoon. Where I'm going tomorrow morning, 48% of the children that signed up for school are designated homeless. They have no hope whatsoever of buying grass-fed beef or antibiotic-free chicken or pork that isn't produced in confinement. So one of our challenges as a group, and, and Jim, thank you for bringing us together, is to figure out how we can make that product available to the very people who need it. Because I don't need any more high quality food. There's a hundred pounds more sitting here than should be. <laughs> so, in, in, in closing, I think if we're gonna talk about scaling up, to me, scaling up is about consolidating, cooperation, and bringing things together. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Retailers are not inherently evil. Not all of them, anyway. <laughs> but, but, They've got some good things going on, and if we're going to feed 9 billion people, we've got to access their markets. We've got to work with them to get product into that supply chain, because if we don't, we'll remain niche, and the, the planet can't afford us to remain niche. I mean, the planet needs us to do something, it needs us to do it now. When we first started talking about this, uh, I was talking to Laura Avery, who runs the Santa Monica Farmers Market, and we talked about this topic. She said, "We need Rodney Taylor." I'm like, "Really?" He's like, "Yep. He was a pioneer when he was working at Santa Monica, and now he's off to Riverside in an even bigger district, and he continues to pioneer and you know really work towards bringing you know local food and healthier food uh, to serving these children." So, Rodney, can you tell us a little bit about your story? Absolutely. Um, in 1990, uh, let's see, 1997, um, I was working here in the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District, and at the time we had solid bars in five of our 15 schools. And I had a parent that many of you might know, Bob Gottlieb, who is a <coughs> professor at Occidental College and the uh, director of the Environmental Policy Institute. Uh, approached me, but he didn't approach me as a professor, he approached me as a concerned parent who um, said to me, you know, I was delighted to hear you had solid bar in my daughter's school, but I was dismayed by the fact she would need it. And um, so he had an idea of simply, what if we bought from the local farmer's market? And my initial reaction was, here's another affluent parent with too much time on their hands. <laughs> um, I thought the, the idea would fail, so we did an uh, experiment with child care kids, if you can imagine, four, three and four-year-olds, uh, this self-serve solid bar, and we were going to run it for two weeks. It was going to fall on his face, and he would leave me alone, and I'd go back to my work. <laughs> um, and so we set it up, and I go in, and I see these kids going through making choices, but Bob also had some other ideas about how a salad, salad bar should look that wasn't lost on me. And I remember walking in there, and right then how I viewed my job changed. And we began in 97 in one school, and by 2000, we had fully institutionalized farm to school in the uh, Santa Monica Malibu School District. And there were those who said, well, that's the affluent, that's the Republic of Santa Monica. It can't be replicated. So in 2002, I moved to Riverside, a district three times the size, three times less affluent, uh, 29 elementary schools, and in 2005, we began our first uh, salad bar where we bought from local farmers, and we spent $30,000 on three farmers that first year. Uh, last year, the salad bars in 29 of the 31 elementary schools, we spent over a half a million dollars. That's on the salad bar alone. We'll spend $1.4 million on um, 
locally grown fresh fruits and vegetables. So you, we, we're doing a number of great things. We're providing access to children who wouldn't have access. Uh, we're encouraging healthy eating behaviors. We're reducing the carbon footprint on how far food needs to travel. But more importantly, um, it, we're pumping money back into the local economy uh, on small farmers who couldn't find a market or they were going, spending six days a week at a farmer's market. They are now delivering to us twice a week. And we were talking about a farmer that uh, just a minute ago, Jim and I, that we both know, uh, Bob Knight, who is a citrus farmer in Redlands. And he was concerned about uh, the small citrus farmers who couldn't find a market for their crop. And so he would go in and uh, they would pick the uh, citrus and they would donate it to food banks and what have you. And I happened to hear Bob speak at a Kiwanis meeting, gave him my card, told him we should speak. And Bob started selling citrus to us and that was in uh, 2006. Uh, Bob now uh, sells citrus in 36 school districts. And an interesting story, I was up in Sacramento and A.G. Kawamura, who is the secretary for the um, Department of Agriculture, comes to me and he's all excited and A.G.'s a farmer out of Orange County and he's excited and he's shaking my hand and he said, Rodney, those strawberries you had last week were from my farm. Um, the exciting thing in California in terms of scaling up is we can get a quite a bit of produce year-round, unlike some other states in the country. And we can really have an impact on reducing carbon footprint, uh, modifying our children's behavior and providing access. Uh, the point that I'm making here is, and Martin can attest to this, Mark and I have been around here, I've been around the block a few times, and um, you start out in one district, and before you know it, uh, we're looking at regional hubs, we're looking at um, um, the pixie oranges. We started buying from Jim, I guess, back in um, 2000. And I had never known what a pixie uh, tangerine was. And, uh, they're just the most amazing thing, and Jim's talking about providing the entire state. We have that ability. We can change how our children eat in school. We can certainly serve less processed food, more fresh food, get back into cooking. Uh, my message is more of a moral, moral message. Our kids are under attack. They're obese. Uh, three. One in three children are projected to have uh, diabetes in their lifetime, um, to live shorter lifespan than their parents. So the things that we're talking about, our work with Food Focus, is so that we can learn from districts like Chicago and um, of places around the country that don't have the challenges that we have in California and yet have ingenuity that we can bring back to learn how do we scale up here so that we can change the way our children uh, eat at school. Keep in mind, they two, two of the three meals that kids eat in most cases are eaten right in school. So we can have a tremendous impact on their health and well-being and um, get away from these animals that we have to shoot up just so we can feed ourselves because we're just growing at a rate that's unsustainable is really the issue. So um, that has been my involvement. It's been an exciting one. I can tell you in 1997, we were uh, the first known model of its kind. Um, and uh, Farm to School is now in all 50 states and well over 2,000 uh, schools and school districts. So. We're seeing that, we're making that connection as uh, farmers like Jim learn how to, uh, or I shouldn't say learn how, but um, as they figure out how to expand, more and more school districts will have access and we'll see the way our kids eat changing. Uh, we will reverse the effects of obesity on our children. Thank you, Rodney.
for those of you who are interested in this topic, I have 145 in this room. Uh, we've got a, another great lineup of, of school food service directors who are going to be talking more in depth specifically on that topic. So I hope you join us for that. Um, you know, one of the first times I have heard about a corporation uh, talking about a commitment to local food was Google. Um, but like Google is and does, we value um, local, sustainable, all the quality and variety of foods to our, we bring our breakfast, lunch, and dinner to our employees. And we partner with um, very dedicated chefs that value these same, um, same values. And so with, with all the food that goes on in our Google campuses, um, we try to create excitement on a day-to-day -day basis from organizing different CSA programs, CSF programs, um, also bring in guest chefs into our offices, book signings, um, also bringing in food trucks lately. Uh, we were able to bring in a food truck in our New York office, and it is quite possible through a freight elevator. Um, <laughs> and different freight food trucks in our Mountain View offices as well. So we try to keep it exciting. We try to bring our employees out into the farm, uh, farms with tours as well um, and keep educating uh, all our signage and our marketing, merchandising, everything in our cafes. There's well over 20 cafes in the Mountain View campus alone. Nationally, there's over 40 and, and globally probably over 90, office, 90 offices, each with a cafe. So we that's our standard is really um, sourcing locally. Um, all our eggs are uh, cage free, our chickens are antibiotic free, everything that we don't do MSG, all of that is a basic standard that we require through our chefs. So it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's very valuable to um, all of our employees as well. Great, thank you. Uh Uh, last but not least is uh, Karen Beverly, who works for Fresh Point. And uh, first time I met Karen, she was at the San Monica Farmer's Market loading up three trucks of local produce to take from the market to her vast customer network who appreciate food from family farmers that's at the quality level that she's able to source at that market. Uh, Fresh Point is actually owned by Cisco, the largest distributor in the world. And uh, to be able to link that kind of family farm food through a $33 billion company for me is remarkable. Karen, can you tell a little bit more of that story? Um, I started going to the farmer's markets for work about 12 years ago. And um, I was hired by Fresh Point 11 years ago. And at the time, it was really more about finding unique items and items with outstanding flavor. And it became, we wanted to make the, the farmer's market experience um, communicable. So we wanted to let chefs know and um, all of our customers know what I was seeing at the farmer's market. So communication of the experience and of the products became you know, the most important piece of this of this puzzle and so we would do meet the farmer flyers and promote the farmers and talk about the products and what kept coming up was that this all this product was local and we started promoting about 11 years ago local and then sustainable and then certified organic um, products and we made that be a part of every piece of literature that we sent out Every time we talked about products, we talked about where it was from and who grew it. And we developed relationships with the farmers. And I think that's really been another big piece. It's the, the communication of the product, giving our customers the experience or as close as we can get to being there. And then also letting them know where it's coming from and developing relationships with the farmers like you know, Martin met, or Jim mentioned with Martin and a vast, a vast array of farmers that we've developed relationships with over time. And as long as we, you know, treat them with respect and it's a reciprocal arrangement and we feel like it's a real partnership. 
and that we you know communicate well with them and let them know what we need and it's it's really allowed us to grow when I first started going to the farmers market I took a big roll of cash and um, we are a publicly held company so you know writing a check there are no manual checks in our company and I ended up it just kept getting bigger and bigger and we started out with just being a driver it was kind of fun and we go get neat things and then it just like it just snowballed and got bigger and bigger and finally I was with like six thousand dollars of cash and it was like this big wad in my pocket and it was like so scary and, and Bob Polito who is a, a farmer he was on his way home from a farmers market and he always stops the same gas station and he was robbed at this gas gas station and I was like okay that's it <laughs> we have to find a plan B so now we spend significantly more than that a, at farmers markets through the week and we had to get special dispensation from corporate headquarters that I can write checks because it's important to us that we pay our farmers that day that we pay them immediately these are our small farmers who you know our regular 21 or 28 day um, payment cycle just doesn't work for them so I, I think we've tried to be really flexible in how we, it's one of the things I'm most proud of as, as a corporation, that, that we've been really flexible in trying to work this part of this, this element of our program. And we send out a lot of reports every week of the items that we inventory, um, featuring the farmers, letting, we do samples every week to all of our customers, they get a basket, that. These are three items that we think are at peak season right now, and a little kind of story about them. We want our chefs to be able to touch and feel and taste these items, since they, you know, they couldn't go with me to the farmers market. If I could get like a little camera and like do a video the whole way through, the farmers markets are so much fun. I, I wish, I wish there was some way to get everybody to be able to go, and I, I know it's difficult, and a lot of our chefs can't. So I think that scaling up for us has been a function of developing relationships, finding more farmers. Um, we, Martin came aboard like two years ago or three years ago, I think, and it's been fabulous to have another person. This, the whole farmer's market local sustainable program has, has been my purview alone for so long. And to have Martin come on and you know he, he's always out looking for farmers and trying to find new items and, and finding products that will, will work for our customers. So the scaling up for us has been finding more farmers, developing relationships with, with our farmers, and communicating to our customers what's available. Because it really is so much better. Jim mentioned how much better it is even to harvest it all at once and freeze it, how much better it is than having something that's been sitting on a truck for five days and then in someone's warehouse. Um, we are so fortunate to live in Southern California and we try to take advantage of that every day because we have products no one else has and we have availability that's just spectacular. And so if we can communicate that to our customers then we're doing the farmers a service and we're you know, helping our customers too and that's really what we're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. A great panel. Uh, what I suggest is it's lunchtime. I think some people are hungry. We've had a very full morning. Uh, we've got a couple of food trucks on the far side of the quad uh, if you're interested in, in having some lunch. And uh, if you're interested in talking to these panelists, I'd certainly invite you to uh, meet them afterwards. And uh, as I mentioned, there's a uh, um, school food service panel here at 145 and then a whole series of workshops uh, this afternoon focusing on, on food policy and, and other issues. So uh, thank you and uh, we appreciate your joining us.